Welcome into another edition of Ask the Experts. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Callender and back with us today from Remax Twin City Realty, it is Canada's top real estate agent, Faisal and Susie Walla. Hello, Faisal. How are you? Fine, thanks, Dave. How are you? I'm doing well, do, doing well, wrapping up the year, uh, getting ready for the holidays and uh, and unfortunately doing our final Ask the Experts shows of, of the year, but looking forward to bigger and better things next year. Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to it as well. So uh, even with the holidays coming up, you have still been very, very busy, correct? Yes, we're, we're going on full engines right now, right to the end. So the market continues to be strong. We're still listing and selling properties as we speak. So very, very vibrant market in the Waterloo region for sure. If you'd like to get more information as you listen to the show today, you can go online to homeshack.com. Very easy to remember. You can also call Faisal at 519-624-5555. And if you'd like to read about Faisal and, and some great advice, all you have to do is go and uh, pick up his book. I, I have the link here. I'm looking at it on Amazon, The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker published on September the 9th, and uh, it's still doing very well, correct? Yeah, very excited about that. We're still uh, uh, ranking very high on the Amazon list, so it's exciting, and I'm happy that it's well received. And, well, speaking of the book, it kind of directly goes into what we're going to be talking about uh, today on the show, because you have an entire chapter about financial literacy and we've been telling people all week that this is the show you don't want to miss in fact you want to have the kids with you while you listen today because it's never too early to start talking about financial literacy with your children yes absolutely and, and that's very near and dear to my heart uh i've often said that i don't know why schools have not been teaching this and as i was writing my book last year that was one of the things that was so important to me. So I, I contribute an entire chapter to just that and how it's the young people that really need to learn that. Look, we have calculus, physics, and all of that in school, which on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's unlikely you're going to use, yet something so important as basic finances, budgeting, saving, those are all topics that are are really not covered off in much detail, amortizations and, and mortgages and credit scores. And this is so important that young people today, especially today, be exposed to that. Um, sometimes they're not being exposed to it at home. And you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, growing up, I was exposed to a lot of that. So I had an understanding of you know, what it takes to make the mortgage payment or what it takes to to, to make the rent payment and how you have to save and how you have to budget and why it's so important to have a good credit score. I, I, I totally agree. And I really wish that they had had a course like that when I was in high school, because I didn't learn any of this until I went to college. And that by then it was like, oh, I've been given my first credit card, yay, free money. But that's when you learn, no, it is not free money by any, any means. So when you talk about financial literacy, I guess the first question is, what do you mean by financial literacy? Well, what I mean is just by having basic knowledge of day-to-day, -day, a basic understanding of the workings of the economy, and not on a grand scale, but just on a very micro scale. So why do I need to save? What am I actually saving for? Um, what are my taxes going to be at the end of the day if I'm earning some money? Uh, how much do I need to start putting away from my retirement? And, and really with the inflation, with the markets, especially in the housing industry, going up the way they are, it's never too early to start thinking about that. And we as parents, uh, and, I, and, I, and I sit down with my children often, I talk about, you know, savings and why you save and why you invest in compound interest and leveraging your your capital to be able to invest not just saving enough just to buy your own home so those are all things that are so important and just a basic understanding of that because once you have that basic understanding you can apply that over and over again in multiple investments and and your and your wealth strategies moving forward and in your case, do your kids respond well to it? Are they interested in learning about it? 
No, they just want to know uh, that they just want to tell me that the Jordans are only three hundred dollars. Can I can I get three hundred bucks? <laughs> so, All right. I can't I can't say I'm surprised, but you know, I thought maybe being your kids, they'd be a little bit more interested. No, when we're talking. Go ahead. No, my kids are no different than any other kids. It's like, but you know, I think exposure is important and repeated exposure to finances and just sharing what you're doing with your children and what it takes to meet the mortgage payment or what amount of principal is being paid down. Just telling them, hey, I, I made a mortgage payment of $1,500 this month, but only $200 of that actually paid down the, the debt. The rest was just interest. So just those conversations are important to have. So when, when should we start talking to our kids about this? When is, when is the right age? You know, as early as they start either getting an allowance or they're starting to earn some income, whether they're working, you know, they've got a paper route or they're, they're working a part-time job at a fast food restaurant, uh, they have to realize at an early age that that funding, that money that they're receiving, they know how hard it is to earn that money. Now, do they really want to go blow that entire month's pay on a pair of shoes? Or can they put that to better use so that when they're older, they're going to be able to um, have much better things and not have to work as hard to obtain those things. So what's your advice then? Do, do we let them splurge on a thing like the you know, entire month going on shoes? Do we let them make that mistake once? So the basic rule, and I talk about this in my book, is that always put 20% away. 20% of every dollar you make Put that into some some form of savings. There's TFSAs if if if, if they if the children are 18 years old. If they're not, just a basic savings account, and start putting that there so that at some point you're going to be able to take a sum of money and invest it. Whether it's in some sort of funds, bonds, real estate. Um, partnering with someone, but it doesn't have to be a lot of money. There's always an opportunity to get your foot in the door. And we, and, you know, I talk about different ways of buying an investment, whether it's, um, you know, through a group or through partnering or through family, but there's all sorts of options and, and it's never too early to, to understand how that works. So what are the topics we should be bringing up first? What, what is there for them to know? So the basics are, you know, of course, how much income am I making? What is 20% of that income? Where do I put that money? How much of that income is actually going towards taxes and other expenses? How much money do I need to live off of? Um, and again, depending again, how young the, the person is and whether they're working full time, uh, but this applies to anyone. Uh, so those are just the, the basic fundamentals and, and there's so many resources out there where one can extract information from and we can talk about that as well as to where to get that information and uh, when we talk to them about investments what what kind of investment should we talk to them about what's available so i'm a firm believer in real estate investments uh but i'm also a firm be believer in diversification so don't put all your eggs in one basket there is a place for mutual funds. There is a place for stocks and bonds and TFSAs, um, perhaps um, venture capital. It depends on where one is at and, and depends, and this doesn't apply just to young people. This applies to everyone. That bricks and mortar is a very safe way of investing. It's a tangible. Um, the, the cycle is always up. So you can't really go too wrong investing in real estate. And if the only investment in real estate is your personal home, so be it. At least own your personal home. At least invest in your personal dwelling. Stop paying rent and put some money into a tangible asset such as real estate and an appreciating asset such as real estate. If you've just joined us, what we're discussing on the show today is financial literacy and not just for adults. All week long, if you've been listening to 570 News, we've been saying, bring the kids in to listen to the show today so that they can start getting used to this term, financial literacy, as we talk about. Uh, as we're talking about it today, the, the things that I guess we need to know are what, what do we need to know? What are, what are some of the topics we should be bringing up with them? So, you know, there, there's two fundamentals here. There's debt 
and then there's equity. There's asset building, and then there's leveraging your debt or having debt simply. So at the end of the day, you want to end up with zero or no debt or very little debt, but lots of assets and lots of equity. So that's really the basic fundamental of understanding how to put your money to work for you so that there's actually appreciation of your money as opposed to depreciation, just sitting there doing nothing or worse yet, you're spending it on things that you don't need and you're not spending it on something that's going to create financial wealth for you in the future. Um, so leaning into that, we, it is very important in understanding how to invest, what the steps are to invest, um, how you get started. And that's, that's probably uh, something that people struggle with the most because they don't know where to turn, what are the resources available or who to turn to or, or how to just get their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do we start that discussion with our kids? What, what should we talk about first? So as my, you know, my son is 18 years old and my nephews are just in, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. So I sat them down about six, seven months ago and I said, look, you guys are starting to earn some money. You guys have savings from your entire life, from be it from birthday presents or whatever you've, you've saved up over time. And if you've got some money and you can't do it yourself, partner up. Partner with your cousins, partner with your family, partner with dad, partner with mom, and just take 15%, 10% interest of a project. So if mom and dad aren't already investing, they should be because that's going to be very important, not only for uh, their retirement, but for them to create wealth and have something to leave behind for their children, because it's going to be very difficult for children to build that kind of wealth now in these times. So if parents can involve their children, say, OK, you know, you've got $20,000 saved up or $10,000 saved up. The down payment requirement on this investment is $80,000 on a $500,000 investment, let's just say why not come in for 10% or 15% interest in that? The beauty of that is that the debt that's on there being the mortgage is going to get paid down over time. So let's say the person is 20 years old today. As that amortization comes to an end and it comes to an end in say 20 years, that is going to go to zero, that debt. And now that 10% that they put down is going to be worth tenfold really because of appreciation. So you've not only paid down debt using tenant money, renters money, you've now created a source of equity for you to leverage from to buy other investments. And, and it's just so important that, that that leveraging part is so important because until you come to a point where you don't uh, need to buy more assets because everything is paid off, uh, you can continue doing so and live off of the rent into your retirement. What are some of the other investments as time goes on that you may want to talk to your kids about uh, taking a look at? Well, you know, we, we're, in an, in, we're in a time right now where technology, um, you know, medicine, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, but you have to have a strong advisor. You have to have a trusted advisor, someone who knows what they're doing, someone who can really do the proper research and invest knowingly. Look, Bitcoin might be the next big thing. I don't know because that's not an industry that I'm in, but I would certainly listen to an expert who could justify why Bitcoin is a good investment. Someone who got into Bitcoin at $500 a share uh, is doing or a coin is doing very well right now at over twenty thousand dollars a bitcoin. Had I known that, or had I been in that industry, I'm pretty sure I would have been heavily invested in that. So that's a good way to sort of look at. Again, find industry experts and rely on them to give you advice, and and go with people that you trust. Well, uh, not all of us get to have a real estate expert as a dad. So where do we find these mentors? Where, where should we start to look? So as young people, we're on, we're on YouTube all day long and, 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 and Google and whatnot. There are 
thousands of videos and resources available on YouTube. And if you just Google, I want to invest my money or I'm thinking about buying real estate. You know, in, in the old days where I came from, you had to yeah, write in and you'd get cassette tapes or CDs and you'd have to uh, download them or put them into your recorder and listen to these recordings. Um, and you've got to be very careful. There's a lot of um, get rich quick schemes out there. If it sounds too good to be true, it really is. Have someone you can personally talk to and have a better understanding. Find mentors, read books, un get a proper understanding of the workings and do it on a localized regional level. You don't want to learn about uh, KW real estate from somebody in Beverly Hills. You want to learn from somebody that's local and is doing that and is doing it successfully. I guess the one good thing about us having the level of technology we do in the internet now is you mentioned get rich quick schemes. A good way of checking to see if something is do, too good to be true is just to do a Google search and see what other people have said about it. Yeah, that is, that's, a, that's a great resource. And that's the advantage that we have. And especially young people, they have all this stuff at their fingertips. Just get on, do your research and just get a, an under basic understanding of how it all works. Well, other than uh, get rich quick schemes and things that seem to be good to be true, what, what are some of the other pitfalls that young people should be looking out for? So, you know, they've got to make sure and backing up to a personal pitfall that they may have is they've, they've got the right intent. And you mentioned earlier on in the show, you get this credit card and you rack it up and then you, you let it go for a few months and then until your next uh, paycheck comes or next gift comes in. But by then you've ruined your, your credit score. So it's very important that you maintain a high level of credit. You pay your bills on time, but you also watch out for, again, like I said, that sort of anything that sounds like it's too good to be true, just stay away from it. Don't get caught up in the quick money. Let me flip this. Let me assign, you know, do an assignment quickly and just make some quick money. Your focus should be always on building wealth long term, not doing that one-off flash in the pan deal. And do you have any advice for finding uh, the right partners, the right support? I mean, it's great if you've got a parent that you can go in on an investment with, but if you don't, uh, how do you know for sure that you're going in on something with someone you can trust? So you've got to, again, do your research to who that person is. Have they done these investments before? Ask them like, okay, can you tell me um, where else have you invested? I get asked that question every day of my life. Like, what is your success rate? Have you done this before? If I'm going to buy in this complex, a unit that you're telling me to buy, are you yourself invested in it? Or are you just trying to sell me on it? Um, talk to your banker. Make sure that you have the means to close on a deal. Uh, but again, find people that can guide you. And there's a lot of people that are happy to give you direction without trying to make some money off of you. Um, the multi-level partnering is very important. If there's an option to partner with like-minded individuals, there's nothing wrong with it. And I know sometimes people are a little reluctant to take on partnerships, but if you do it right, if you speak to a lawyer and go through the right process, don't ever get emotionally involved in purchasing a property. Don't fall in love. Remember, this is an investment. So do your due diligence, get a home inspection, Get all of your ducks in a row. Make sure that you're not missing something and don't get sort of taken away by the makeup that of, of something and, the, 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 you know, that new car smell. Don't, don't fall for that. On the show today, we are talking about having the discussion about financial literacy with, with your kids and, you know, starting them off early to, to understand what it is about and the importance of building wealth. And uh, people at home may be listening going, I, I don't know that my teenager is going to be terribly interested in this. And if they are, they might be very, very unsure about taking their first steps. Like, you know, can a teenager really go out and buy a property? But the fact is, you did. That's, that's how you got started in this business. So why don't you tell us a bit about your own personal experiences and, and maybe that'll help inspire someone. Sure. So um, as many uh, people know, I was 17 years old when I took my real estate course, but I was too young to get licensed. So I had to wait until I was 18 to actually get my real estate license. 
But once I got my real estate license, I was still in high school and we were just graduating that year and going into university and whatnot. And of course I decided that I wasn't going to take that route and I was going to stay in real estate. And, but I had many of my friends who were very intrigued about this sort of change that had happened. And I decided to go into the world of business and real estate. Of course, I didn't own any real estate personally. I lived with my parents and they owned their home. Um, so I decided one day that it would be a great idea to get a group of us together and buy one property, just our first property. So I reached out to six or seven of my friends and that accumulated to 10 friends. Now I don't recommend that. That's a mistake. Don't ever have 10 friends buying a property together, but we actually incorporated a company and I, I believe it was called invest 10 P E N, um, development corp. And we purchased our first property. I was 19 and most of my friends that were in that corporation were also 19. We all put together enough money to put 25% down. And I think the property value at the time was somewhere around 125 or $150,000. So we put that together. We then went to the bank and asked them to give us a mortgage uh, for that property. And in those days, it was an assumable mortgage. So we were able to just take over the balance of the mortgage that was there. Today, now even though we were able to do that, they still wanted a couple of our parents to co-sign for us. So our parents did that for us and that was very helpful in just showing credibility because most of us didn't have any credit. It wasn't that we had bad credit, we just had no credit because we didn't even have credit cards at that time. And this is, we're talking 32 years ago. So at that point, we bought this property, it was a duplex, it had a basement apartment, we rented out all three units. But what that taught us was that all of a sudden our mortgage started getting paid down and the property values continued to increase. Now that, as I mentioned, there was too many sort of uh, chefs in the kitchen there, it didn't work out very well for us, but we did out of that group end up with three or four members of the group that continued investing. So the second property was when I was 20 years old, we bought a nineplex using some of the equity that we had received from the first property. And again, asking the seller to hold some financing for us and the balance we got from the bank. So there, there was an element of financing and being creative on that, but we had very experienced and knowledgeable people in the finance world that were able to hold our hands and take us seriously and say, okay, I'm going to help you. So, you know, I'm very grateful for those people that didn't just brush us off. And, you know, that's why I, I, I say that parents should really pay attention to educating their children on finances, but also supporting them if that's what the route they want to go. The rental income that we started receiving on this nineplex was extraordinary and we were able to reinvest some money, get higher rents on it, and again, pay that down. And you know, I'm happy to say 30 years later, the three of us that bought that building still own that property today. We never sold it, more for sentimental reasons than anything else. But I can tell you that the purchase price on that building was about 300,000 and we have extracted at least over a million dollars over the cycle that we've owned that property for various different investments that we want to make, be it um, other properties. Uh, at one time, one of us, one of our friends was getting married, so needed some money for down payment and to pay it for the wedding. But we never sold the asset. We always kept that asset. So that's the power of leveraging. And I can truthfully say that had I not made that initial investment, I wouldn't be able to build the type of real estate portfolio that I did. It was that one little seed that I planted way back when, and I used nine other friends to help me do that, just as they used me to help them. And that's multi-level partnering. If you can have two or three people, and if you can't, if it's your parents that can just include you in, your next in, in the next investment, that's what's going to help you on that trajectory of building your own wealth. I'm curious, I have to ask, as 20 years old, owning a nineplex, who, who was doing the maintenance on the building? Were you doing it or did you find someone to do it for you? It, it, was, it was a combination. It depended on what needed to be done. So if the unit needed to be cleaned out, 
I was doing it. My brother was there. My partners were there. We just all got together and did whatever had to be done. Demolition work, cleaning out units, um, painting, whatever had to be done. Now, anything that we were not skilled enough to do, which we had very little skill, uh, we had amazing networks of trades that we could call up and say, can you please go do this for me? And of course, you have to be mindful of where you're spending your money because you could spend a lot in renovations. We had no idea what we were buying. So all the things that I'm saying, you should do an inspection, you should do this, did nothing of, did nothing of the sort. Learn the hard way through those experiences what to do so that you don't get caught. But even, even doing those investments in those ways and, and, and falling down many times, it still allowed me to create a large real estate portfolio, leveraging those assets. And over time, those properties always went up. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that you had some really great financial professionals on your side, some mentors. And we, we did, did already mention that nowadays you, you would probably go on the internet to find them. But back when you did it, how did you find those people? Did you just go out and start knocking on some doors? It was picking up the phone and saying, I need help. Can you give me 20 minutes of your time and show me if this is possible for me to do? And again, you know, I, I, I have to say that I don't know if times have changed or haven't changed, but I can tell you it was, it was so rewarding to be able to sit across the table from someone. I could call a lawyer as a young person and, and ask him a question and he didn't send me a bill for it. You know, so it was building relationships. And when you start building your relationships and you'd be surprised at, at how much people who have sort of done well in their life want to help people that are inspired to do well in their lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you certainly have helped a great number of people throughout your, your career as well. So I want to go back to the fact that you said, don't get 10 friends together that that is a, a mistake. Knowing and learning from that now, if you were about to go and get some partners to make your first uh, investment, what, what is a good number? What would you think? You know, three to four people, depending on the size of the investment. So really reduce it down to the number that you absolutely need to make that investment work. Look, if you can do it on your own, always do it on your own. But you can grow a lot more together and you can diversify a lot more and you can spread the risk so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket uh there could be an investment that looks really good and you're like you know what i'm going to keep this one for myself but what if it didn't turn out to be as good because there are no real guarantees so if you can spread the risk you can do more and if one doesn't turn out to be such a great investment maybe the other one will carry that investment so three to four people i like to i like to have a minimum ownership of 25 percent in any project that i have so about a quarter to, is, is a safe number and it's still equitable at the end you're you're still getting a good return and your money is still growing at a good pace at that percentage of interest uh, now as someone young starting out, like I said, the 10 friends, we all had 10% interest. So it goes back to if mom and dad are buying an investment property, insist that you give them your money up to 10% of that investment, meaning the down payment, not the purchase price. And mom and dad will certainly co-sign for you on the mortgage. Well, one would hope. Come on, mom and dad, help us out here. So how does a young person find that initial property or investment? Uh, how do you find it and say, you know, I think that is a good first thing for me? So, you know, go based on what your means are. Go based on what your knowledge is. So if you live in a geographical area and you're familiar with the area and you see that it's a nice neighborhood and there's opportunities there and you see some for sale signs, look, the region of Waterloo, especially Kitchener with the tiny house mandate that's going, coming on in the next uh, six, seven months in the, in the new year, um, you know, there's going to be opportunities to actually have income property in addition to income property on those parcels. So if you have a single family home there, you can add up to two more units on that property. So that's a whole other 
uh, chapter that we can talk about, but there's opportunities that are coming. So look at those opportunities. Keep your mind open. There are government programs for first time home buyers where the government will, will help you. The region of Waterloo has a down payment program. If you don't have all of your down payment, they will help you. So there, you know, the government can also be your partner. It's a little bit more expensive to have the government be your partner. CMHC, Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, is partnering with you essentially if you don't have your down payment because they're insuring that debt and they're telling the bank that we are the co-signer essentially. And if, you know, Faisal doesn't pay his debt because he only put 5% down, we're going to insure you, the bank, and we'll go after Faisal. So there's no, there's no free ride here, but at least there's opportunity. Sometimes it's not, it's a little bit more expensive to get into these programs but it's better to be in than sitting on the sidelines watching your friends build wealth while you don't. Uh, before we finish up the segment, you piqued my interest. What, what is the tiny house mandate that you were talking about? So Kitchener has a, a bylaw that they're uh, introducing and all the details are not out on this, but you could have a separate dwelling provided you have the land area on your property. So in your home, if you've got a lot that's, let's say 60 by 140, uh, you could essentially build a hundred and I believe it's up to 180 square foot home. So the, the main dwelling must be 145 square feet, if I'm correct. And up to, uh, that does not include the bathroom, but it must have its own services. So its own water coming to it, its own sewer system coming to it, its own hydro coming to it. But you could essentially build, and like if you Google tiny homes, you'll see these modular homes that you can just buy for sixty or eighty thousand dollars, plot it onto your backyard, and now start collecting rent on that. You have to go for permits. You have to go through the right channels. Uh, you have to meet the mandate and the requirements of the city of Kitchener in order to do that. But you know, watch watch out for this. This is go this is a reality. This is coming. Up to three dwellings per lot will be a reality very very soon. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dave Callender. My guest Faisal Susie Walla, Canada's top real estate agent with Remax Twin City Realty. Give him a call, 519-624-5555, or go online to his website at homeshack.com. If you joined this partway through the show today, the topic is financial literacy, not just for adults. We're talking about sharing this information with your kids and starting at an early age, uh, because I, as we said, I didn't get to learn about this in high school. I'm hoping that maybe they'll start doing that, but Parents can certainly take the uh, the initiative and get them started on it. So we talked at the start of the show about what is financial literacy. Now that we're financially literate, what 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 is the goal? What is what is it we're trying to achieve? So we so we understand now that the importance of budgeting. We understand the importance of taking twenty percent of everything you earn and putting it away so that you can invest that. Um, we're understanding the importance of uh, creating a good credit score, so pay your bills on time. And we're also now a little bit clearer, I think, on why we want to create wealth and how we're going to go about that and what the workings are. So we understand that a certain portion of um, payment that you're making is going towards your principal and a large portion of that is going towards the interest but that's you know there's an amortization there so as you own a property longer a larger portion of your principal is being paid down and less interest is being paid out so the goal here is to get your foot in the door on your first property so that you can start leveraging that property that over time you're going to create wealth and create independence and by doing so you're not only going to help yourself you're going to help your communities you're going to help your, your children your family you're going to create a life for yourself which will give you passive income so you're not grinding every day to make that money you're you've got some residual money coming to you without having to get up every day and go to work and punch the clock or whatever it is you do and it's so important that we realize that even more important than earning the money, it's saving the money. And by putting it into an investment, and for me, it's real estate, you are forcing yourself. It's a forced savings. 
And by doing so, it's a forced appreciation and it's forced pay down of debt. So there's so many benefits that it's just unbelievable. And I am shocked when I hear that people still choose to rent because they want an easier lifestyle. But long, long term, that's not going to be an easy lifestyle. So the struggles that you have today and the sacrifices that you make today are going to pay out immensely later on in life. And you'll be grateful that you put some of your money away and put it into some investments. And if nothing else, into your own principal residence, just one house. Uh, along with this, of course, is that once you start making the money is budgeting and doing sensible things with it instead of just going, Yay, I, I made a thousand bucks today. I'm gonna to go buy three pairs of shoes. So how do we how do we bring up budgeting with our kids and what do we need to tell them? So, you know, and in, in, in today's world, um, you know, with all the noise, all the social media, all the trying to keep, you know, it's not it's not even about keeping up with the Jones anymore. It's keeping up with Hollywood and it's keeping up with, you know, the the trendsetters of the world. And that's the challenge that our children face today that they have this immense pressure to, you know, sort of portray this image. But if you can step out of that for a moment and say, where's that going to get me? Yes, it's going to get me those nice pairs of shoes and I'll be happy for a little while, but that's going to wear out and that fashion trend is going to change. So it's just drilling into young people's heads and not just young people. I think everybody needs to understand that yes, we all like nice things. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, splurging once in a while and doing those things. But don't make a habit of it. It's important to reward yourself. You've done well, you've worked hard, reward yourself. Buy that nice watch or whatever it is that you want. But, uh, you know, as, as Steve Jobs says, a $30 watch tells the same time as a $300 watch. So spend your money wisely but invest it even why even more wisely so that you have something to show for it you're not going to have too much to show for those jordans that you spent 300 dollars on no unfortunately not some of the other things that are on our list of what is financial literacy is talking to your kids about uh interest rates what what is it we should be passing along to them about interest rates well the interest rates involve in one interest compounds so you know if you're saving and you are you're earning interest it's there's there's books on compound interest so you'll learn about that but also if you have high rates of interest if you're paying interest for long periods of time your money is not generating income if you're paying down you're paying debt not even paying down debt you're just paying debt so it's important to really shop you know if you think oh you know i'm you know it's only two and a half percent the other guy's at 2.3%, I'll just go with the two and a half. That 0.2 can make a huge difference over a 20 year amortization or a 20 year payment cycle. So understand how interest works. Understand that interest is accumulating on your debt if you're not paying down the principal. Uh, establishing credit, again, that's another thing that's important to, to get across to young people. But at the same time, we're telling them that being in debt is bad. That, that, that is bad. But how do we establish credit without experiencing a little bit of debt? So if you have to, uh, as a parent, I have given each of my kids a credit card, but I make them pay it off at the end of every month. So what that shows is their habit is not to carry debt. Their habit is to pay off their debt. By doing so, they're establishing a good credit score. Now, and we, we, as, uh, we as adults should also get into the habit. And if you can't pay off your, your credit card debt each month, at least make the payment on time. Don't risk it. Don't go a day over. Because if you go a day over, it's going to be reported on your credit bureau that you are delayed in paying your debts. And no one wants to give you money if you don't pay your debts on time. It's surprising how many folks have never ever taken a look at their, their credit bureau, their credit score. Uh, for folks who haven't done that before, how do they go about doing that, Faisal? So uh, there are many resources. There's Equifax, there's TransUnion, you can call your banker. So there's many ways of just going online. You've got to put your credit card in and it'll tell you what your credit score is. Now, caution there, you don't want to pull your credit score too often and you don't want someone pulling your credit score too often because then you look like a credit seeker 
who's trying to go out and get lots of credit from all sorts of various places. And that actually has a negative effect on your credit rating. So be very careful. Really cherish your credit and really maintain it and, and hold on to that and keep improving your score. But don't make a habit of pulling your credit bureau or asking somebody to do that for you. But it's important uh, to establish it early. Early on. Early on, start establishing credit. Okay. Uh, we've got about a minute and a half left in the show, Faisal, as we wrap things up. What, what, again, just to, to consolidate what we've talked about today, what do you want to tell young people who are listening to the show? So I want to say it's, it's never too early to start. You know, we have our little piggy banks. Start, start with that. Start a savings account. Start asking mom and dad questions. Ask them, hey, how does this whole mortgage thing work? Do I just miraculously live in this house for free? Like, what, what does it take to have that? But it's never too early to start. And start educating yourself. Create knowledge for yourself. Ask someone to be your mentor. Learn people's story. Learn about their journey. See how they did it. Get inspired. You know, you're, you're on YouTube anyways. Just switch over to some of those educational channels about people talking about creating wealth. But don't get caught up in the hype. If somebody's getting giving you the rah-rah, go the other way. Just get basic knowledge and start in a very localized way. Start small and build your wealth slowly. But longevity is the key here. Faisal, thank you so much for being on the show with us once again. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me, Dave. My guest, Faisal Suziwala of Remax Twin City Realty, online at homeshack.com, or give him a call at 519-624-5555. And if you've got a young person who seems eager to learn, here's a great Christmas gift idea. Go online and get a copy of uh, The Real Deal from Amazon. You'll find it on amazon.ca. Thanks for listening. We hope you join us again next time for more of Ask the Experts here on 570 News.